yeah. So the, the two statistics, that's actually an interesting story. So the, the polynomials were defined in 96, I think, using McDonald polynomials theories or some kind of, it, it was originally, it, they were defined, it was not clear that these are even polynomials in Q and T, let alone with like positive integer coefficients. And so people had been trying to guess the statistic. Like it was clear that one statistic is gonna be area, but they were trying to guess the other ones. And, and at some point, right, at some point, Jim Haglund came up with uh, a statistic called bounds, which is different from what I explained. And it, it worked experimentally. So, and then there was some kind of email correspondence between Haglund and Garcia. And so anyways, Haglund told Garcia and Garcia told Hyman and Hyman was competitive. So he decided to come up with his own statistic before he, he learns about the balance one. So he came up with the diagonal, with Dinf, the diagonal inversion one. Yeah, so that's, but, but yeah, in, in this particular case, people just guessed the statistic from the, from the data. But uh, generally, of course, there is a lot of times people already know something about the, uh, Okay, hold on, let me try it. Yeah, okay. I mean, a lot of times these statistics are somehow motivated by considerations from representation theory and geometry, but this was not the case for, for the QT Catalan numbers. Any other questions? Okay. So, yeah, so today I'm gonna Today I'm still going to talk about the Q one of the QCatalan numbers and at the next lecture on Friday I'm going to talk about the QT version and uh, how they all come together. But for now I'm going to focus on the, on the point count. So I want to count the points in an open positroid variety over a finite field with Q elements. So the question is how do I do that? And the answer is, uh, like previously I told you how to compute number of points in the Grassmannian using Schubert decomposition, well, there is no, there is none of that for open positroid varieties. You can't really, you can't really decompose them into pieces and each piece is like your field to some number of, to, to some dimension, with the Schubert cell analogs. So, and the answer surprisingly is, well, yeah, so this was computed in this paper and, uh, it was, it was done using knot theory. So today I'm going to talk about knots. Uh, just kind of to briefly, the, the whole construction is completely elementary, so I can, I can explain. So what is a knot? Uh, a knot is, what you should think of is a piece of rope, which is, so you tie it in the, in the three-dimensional space, and then you join the endpoints. So a knot is an embedding, embedding of the circle into a into the three-dimensional space. Uh, you can you can you can say smooth embedding or something like this, and and then you can ask, well, when can when are two knots considered the same? And the answer is that if you can take a piece of rope and then you can continues to deform it without, you know, passing the rope through itself, right? just like as you would with real life. So this is all real life knots. So uh, two knots are isotopic if they can be related by a, let, let's just say by a continuous deformation without uh, self crossings, without introducing any self crossings. Yeah, there's, and ex the exact word is that they are homotopic there is a homotopy between them such that at every point of time you, you have an embedding. Uh, and I don't know if that's clear or not, but you know, let me draw an example of a knot maybe. Uh, 
No, but that's not a, a sending a note to a point is not an embedding. So yeah, you have to like if you want to you want to transform the node continuously so that at every point you have a an injective an injective map that's like a homeomorphism onto its image or something like this. So maybe I can. I had been practicing drawing these knots. So here is an example that's called a trefoil. A trefoil knot. There is also, you can draw something like this that's on knot. Or, or you can also, so instead of considering knots, you can also consider links. Right, so a link, a link is just several pieces of rope tangled together in some way. A link is an it's an embedding of s of a disjoint union of several circles into R3 so for example for example something like this is that's called the unlink i guess or you can do something maybe like this that's called the hop link, and etc. So you can ask, well, are these two knots isotopic, or can is this isotopic to this? Uh, you can you, whenever you have two links, you can ask whether they are isotopic or not. And clearly, uh, the number of kinetic components is, is preserved by an isotopy, but still, you can ask, uh, are these two isotopic? Can, can, can this link somehow be unlinked by some clever fractal procedure? And the answer is, the answer is no in this case. But, and, it, and it's obvious with the naked eye, but in general, if I draw a complicated knot, I don't know, can I, maybe something like, I draw some, something like this. I don't know. Well, okay. Well, you can ask: I Is is this isotopic to the to the unknot or not? It's, if I draw a more complicated knot, it becomes increasingly hard to do. And it, 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 how do you even? Let's say it's not. How do you prove that it's not? Like, do you go through all possible deformations? That's it. and especially if you have a computer, you want you may want to find a way to use a computer for that. So that's that's why people introduced not invariants, and we are going to consider a particularly well. Th that's basically my favorite not invariant because it's it's very simple and at the same time very powerful. Oops, I should. Um, let's say something like this. Yeah. So, any questions so far? Uh, so that's and, and that's called the Humphrey polynomial. So definition: the Humphrey uh, Humphrey, sometimes called also called Humphrey PT polynomial. That's these are all first letters of the author's last names. Humphrey PT polynomial. Which is denoted p of a of a link, right? So of a link L is defined by the following recurrence relation. So it's called this Kane relation. So first of all, p of the un not is normalized to one. Right, that's the that's my drawing of an un not. And also, whenever you have, so the other, the other, the kind of main recurrence relation is, let me first write it down, A times P of L plus minus A inverse of P of L minus is equal to Z times P of L zero, where, 
So where L plus, L minus, and L zero are any three links that differ locally, locally like this. So uh, first of all, you kind of, the first thing you do is you orient, you just pick an arbitrary orientation of every component of your link. And then you look for a neighborhood of a single crossing. Uh, like on a, on, a, on a planar diagram, you look for a crossing that looks like this. And that's your L plus. So this is supposed to be a little tiny piece of your knot, which uh, contains a single crossing. And then L minus is you just switch the switch the crossing and finally L0 is you resolve the crossing. So whenever you see a crossing in your in your not diag in the planar diagram you get to apply a recurrence relation like this. And so far it may not be clear whether this actually defines a well first of all two things that are not clear is that if i give you a knot you can actually algorithmically compute the Homme polynomial and the second question is that uh, that's unclear but it, it's true is that so p of l is a link invariant so in other words if l is isotopic to L prime, and then P of L is equal to P of L prime. Oh, sorry, yeah, so, so P, uh, a, a and Z are just two variables. So P of L is a Laurent polynomial, well, it's a Laurent polynomial in A and Z. Yes, thanks. So yeah, and so, so and, and it specializes to many well, well known like uh, the Alexander polynomial and the Jones polynomial. Uh, you, you get all of those as special cases, but yet the definition is very kind of just you just have a single relation. So let me try to do some examples. Let's say, well, first of all, I know that the Homfully polynomial of the unknot is equal to one. So what is the next thing I can compute? Okay, two unknots. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Uh, that was that was actually that's actually what I'm gonna. So what is? Uh, how do I compute p of of two unknots? Okay, yeah, that that's actually true, right? So you can you can s you can set l plus and minus and l zero. So if l zero is two unknots, then you can you can set l minus l plus to be this, and l minus to be to be this, which are both of them are unknots. So you can so you can write down the recurrence relation, uh, which is going to be. A times P of L plus, which is one, minus A inverse. I did it right, A inverse? Yes, okay. And inver uh, inverse times P of L minus, which is also one, is equal to Z times P of L naught, which is, which is what we're looking for. So P of, of the two on link is just given by a minus A inverse over Z. Yeah. And then I guess the next thing I want to compute is is the is the Hopf link. So let's say let's say L L is this, what is P of L? 
density of the half link. Well, you can do. Uh, wh what can you do? Yeah, it doesn't tell me. Wait, can you say it again? Uh, is the idea that, like, I just so I understand this, like, L plus L minus L naught thing, it's that all of these links are, are the same except at the one crossing? Um, yes, right. So the okay. Okay. all links are exactly, you just, you just modify the link locally, right? So in this case, you could, you could choose a single little crossing. Wait, let me go back to the, to the headphones. Um, so yeah, you, you can choose a single crossing. And so you can set that maybe th this link is, let's say, L plus. Why do this going on? OK. And then L minus is going to be, so question is, what's going to be L minus and L zero? Okay, thanks. That is that is true. Uh, yeah. So as you result, as you swoop, swap this cross, and you get your two links get separated. Yeah, okay, so p of l plus p of l plus times a minus a inverse of p of l minus, which is which is this thing here. A minus times A minus A inverse over Z is equal to uh, Z times P of L zero, which is one. So you can, from here, you can find P of P of the of the hop link. It is given. Let's see. I think it's supposed to be something like this. Um, Z squared plus one minus A minus a to the negative 2. I think that's the, that's the, what the answer is going to be just from this re recurrence. So anyway, the point is that, and you can always compute. Whenever you have a complicated knot, you can keep chipping away these little crossings and solve these, solve the recurrence for every knot. And computers are very good at this. So, and that's actually what I use. Whenever I have two knots, I want to know if they're the same. I use the home flip and usually it, Whenever the two knots are the same, in practice you always get that you almost always get that the polynomial is the same. So yeah, uh, okay. How is this? How is this related to any of the of the of the positroid stuff we talked about before? Well, let me let me introduce one more one convenient way of encoding a knot. So and that's going to be related. So. It's going to be related to the Coxeter group business we discussed a while ago. So the braid group, the braid group is braid group, which is denoted BR sub N, is what you do is you take the Coxeter group and you remove the relation where SI squared is equal to one. So you don't get this relation, but all the other relations are the same. So it's it's generated, and I'm going to know this generated by sigma, so sigma one, sigma two, all the way up to sigma n minus one, uh, and the relations relations are the braid relation, sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i is equal to sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one. And also, if the two indices are far away, then sigma i, sigma j is equal to sigma j, sigma i. And the way you represent sigma i, the way you represent sigma i is you draw a bunch of strands. So you draw n strands, but two of them make a positive crossing, i, i plus 1. And 
So that's sigma i and sigma i inverse is the same where the, the crossing goes in the opposite direction. So sigma i squared is not, is not the identity. So, uh, and so if you multiply a few of them together, you get what is called a braid. So maybe I should give you an example. Let's say sigma 1, sigma 2 squared, sigma 1 inverse, maybe something like this. So you draw sigma 1, and then you draw sigma 2 squared. Nope. And then you draw sigma 1 inverse. So that's that you get a braid in the braid group on three strands. Okay. And and so okay, the braids are not exactly the same as knots, but you can you can make every braid into a knot using so if so if beta is a braid you can get you can define the closure which I'm going to know like beta hat of beta. Uh, and, and this closure I is obtained by closing the braid into a link. So the way this works is that you, you take your you take your braid, this is this is beta, and then you just connect. So the, there is there is three there is n endpoints on the left and n endpoints on the right, and then you just connect the the corresponding endpoints. So let me you just connect the first endpoint to the first endpoint and the second to the second. It's called the, sometimes it's called the rainbow closure. So you don't introduce any new crossings, you just kind of close the braid like this. And this way you get a planar diagram of, of, a, of a link, right? In, in general, it's gonna have several, like this link has one connected component that, lo that looks like this. And is this clear or any questions? So uh, okay, okay. Now now they have braids. Still, still it's on. Yeah. Uh, no. Oh no no no. Uh, yeah. This this is this is just a coincidence, right? In general, if you if you take a different braid, maybe maybe if you take a braid like this, and then you take the closure. So that's sigma two sigma one. You take the closure, it depends on the number of connected components or, or number of cycles of the correspondent permutation. If you, if you forget about the uh, over under crossings, you get a permutation, a wiring diagram. It depends on the number of cycles of that wiring diagram. Okay, now how do I go back to positroids? So, question is how to go from given a, let's say, bounded affine permutation, how do you associate a link to this bounded affine permutation? And there is one way that's actually beautiful to use in play, choosing a playbook graph. You can, you can do this using the playbook graph. But I'm going to describe another way, which, and conjecturally, they are the same. But for uh, one of them can be used to compute the number of points, and the other one we don't know how to use. So let me let me describe the one that's slightly more complicated, but but works better in for for the applications. And that's actually so. This definition is useful throughout combinatorics. If you if you haven't seen this before as the definition of the Brewer order. 
which is a, a is an or is a partial order on Sn or on any Coxter group for that matter, as defined as follows. So if you have V and W, just two permutations, then uh, then you write that you say that V is less than or equal to W if uh, let's say if if a well if a reduced word for v appears as a subword not necessarily consecutive of a reduced word for w for for w so maybe let's say w is s1 s2 s1 s3 s2 something like this then you choose an arbitrary maybe you choose s2 and s3 and then v if e, v is equal to s2 s3 then v is less than or equal to w in the brua order and there is there is a whole bunch of lemmas going into this definition. For example, this definition appears like it depends on the choice of a reduced word for W. But actually, so actually a fact is that this definition doesn't depend on the choice of a reduced word for w so you can maybe if you apply replace s1 s2 s1 with s2 s1 s2 then you're still going to be able to find s2 s3 as a sub word of that of that other reduced word is that clear okay so so that's the brio order and then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to every, to every bounded affine permutation, I'm going to associate a pair of permutations. So, uh, and one of, one of them is going to be, so let me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a number of definitions, so, but I'm almost done with the construction. So uh, a permutation is called K Grassmannian if it satisfies W of 1 less than W of 2 etc less than W of K and W of K plus 1 is less than etc less than W of N so uh, it's a permutation that has at most one descent and such permutations are such permutations are in bijection with uh, Young diagrams inside a k times n minus k rectangle. So there is there is n choose k such permutations, which are determined by basically the set of values from one up to k. And the easy way to to draw them is to so you, you you draw a k by n minus k rectangle, and then you and then you draw some Young diagram. Maybe it looks something like this, and then you label the the top left boundary by integers from one up to n, and then you label the bottom boundary. And then you just, so your W sends 1 to 3, 2 to 4, 3 to 7, and 4 to 1, 5 to 2, 6 to 5, 7 to 6, and 8 to 8. So W is... Yeah, 1 goes to 3, 3, 4, 7, one, two, and five, six, eight. And you see that these numbers are 
these numbers are increasing and these numbers are increasing. Right? So that's the and any any Grassmannian permutation can be can be obtained from a unique Young diagram like this. And in particular, you can you can use the Young diagram to to find a reduced word for W. So there was the homework homework problem about fully commutative elements and Grassmannian permutations are fully commutative. So there is a basically a unique reduced word modular modular commutation relations. And then generally just what you do is you, if you take if you have a n minus a by uh, k by n minus k rectangle then you can you can label the you can label all the boxes by you can label all the boxes by SIs where the indices are constant along the diagonals. So S K plus one sk plus 1 and etc up to sn minus 1 so for this example you can you can write uh, s3 s3 s2 s2 s1 s1 s5 s6 and then you just multiply them in this order so w is s3 s2 s4 s1 s3 s5 s2 s6 You kind of multiply them in any order, and what you get is a strand diagram. It's a wiring diagram that looks like this, basically. Any questions on this? I'm multiplying them in any order where, uh, in any order where things have to in have to increase in, 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 in the rows and the columns. So S3 has to go first and then either S2 or S4 has to go and etc. And that's, so that's gonna give you, anyway, I, I see no questions, but let me know if there is a, if something is unclear. So, uh, Yes, and finally, the the last piece of information before I define the uh, def before I describe the construction is that let me introduce a particular bounded affine permutation, which is going to be denoted tau k sub n. It's going to send tau k n of i is going to be either i plus n or i. Uh, so it's i plus n if i is between 1 and k and i if i is between k plus 1 and n so the 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 the if i if i draw tau kn then wh what it's going to do is going to send the first k elements it's going to send i to i plus n so it sends 1 to 1 plus n and 2 to n plus 2 to 2 plus n etc and all the rest it says kind of it sends just i to i and then this pattern just continues by n periodicity So yeah, it's it's a little bit, it's this construction is a little complicated, but it works. So he, so here's the construction, which I'm gonna, which I'm gonna uh, explain using a picture. So the construction is that well, a proposition is that any bounded affine permutation can be uniquely factored as f right I'm, I'm multiplying bijections from z to z 
And what I do is I multiply f is equal to v times tau case k comma n times w inverse for a for a pair v comma w in for a pair of permutations in a sense such that such that uh, v is less than or equal to w in the Brewer order and w is k Grassmannian. So, and yeah, that sounds like a lot of conditions, but it's actually pretty, pretty simple. So, so what's going on in this picture? First of all, you, you take the k by n minus k rectangle, and then you choose a Young diagram. And you label the Young diagram by indices which are constant on the diagonals. So in this case, w is, you just multiply them from in this direction. So w is s2, s1, s3, s2, s4. And, and then you kind of, you flip w a little bit and then you, you kind of draw it like this. So that's, and, and then you extend it periodically. That's your, that's your first factor in the product. And then you just, and then you, so the second factor here is just tau, this is supposed to be tau k comma n. And finally, the last factor is, is a permutation v, which is less than w in the Brewer order which means that you take the reduced word for w and you take a sub word from that. In this case, so the dots represent the, uh, the, the letters which I didn't take. So, so v is equal to s1, and that's where you see the, the s1 is here. Right, so s1 is a sub word, is a sub word of, of this reduced word, right? And so it, it actually corresponds to some subset of the squares of the Young diagram. And the point is that, the point is that any bounded affine permutation can be represented uniquely in this way. And so how do you, how do you prove that it's unique, this representation? And well, the kind of, the easiest thing to do is you can recover W. You can recover W by, so if you draw a vertical line, if you draw a vertical line between, let's say zero and one, or n and n plus one, then uh, what you're gonna see is that the, the only places where it, your permutation can intersect this line is, is right, uh, is, going from one and two to one plus n and two plus n. Well, one up to k, you send tau k n sends the indices from one up to k to kind of n steps to the right. So that's the only place where you can, you can intersect this, this vertical line. And therefore, if you, so if I show you a picture of f, right, you can, uh, you can kind of just see that three and so, okay. So, if you look at this picture, you're, you're going to see that three and five are the only two indices such that uh, f of three is bigger than n and f of five is bigger than n. And for all the other indices, they are smaller, right? Because they like one goes to here, which can which can then no longer it can no longer cross the vertical line. So by just looking at, by just looking at which indices I satisfy that f of i is bigger than n, you can, there should be exactly, exactly like n minus k of those indices, you can, or k of those indices, you can recover the set of, the k element set which d determines w. Is that clear or is it completely mysterious what I'm doing right now? Mysterious, okay. 
Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, all right, tell me some f. Just a random bounded affine permutation. One, two, three, four, five, of five elements, let's say. Or maybe just a random permutation. Two, one, four, three, five. Two, one, four, three, five. Oops. Wait, you have to you have to tell me whether five goes and steps to the right. The next five. Okay. All right. So I draw a a vertical line between five and one, and then I look at which indices. I look at which indices are. For which indices on top do the does the does the F line cross the horizontal line? And I get two four five. And that means that in my picture, the two, four, and five should land on a should land on a kind of a on, on a line seg on a segment that, that sloped like this. So anyways, the point is that I should have w of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the first, the first k indices have to increase, and the, the, the next three indices have to increase. So I know that for the three indices, I'm going to have to send 3, 4, 5 to 2, 4, 5. That's the, that's the same 2, 4, 5 that I see here. And for the other two, I get um, I get the remaining one. So one and three. That's the that's the W, I guess. So the point is that you extract the k uh, the or n minus k element set f just from your bounded affine permutation, and that and that's w that defines W because W is k cross minus. It's, it's determined fully by a k element set. And of course, I am missing some yeah there is some mismatch of conventions going on but uh, yeah okay never mind and and then you can just you can just recover v from this procedure because by just reducing things modulo n modulo n this guy is the identity and so v v is basically obtained I take an F module N and then multiply it by W. So anyways, this is not really that important. What, what is important is that such a factorization exists and is unique. So in, instead of talking about bounded affine permutations, I can equivalently talk about pairs of permutations such that one is K cross minion, W is K cross minion, and V is less than w in the Brouillard order, which, yeah, so th this construction, you have to play with it for a while to, be, to get comfortable with this. But, it, but, and from now on, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk about v and w. Oh, let me do, let me do one more example. So one more example is that, uh, is that f is equal to fk comma n. Right, the permutation that uh, sends i to i plus k modulo n. In this case, what's going to happen is that v is going to be the identity and w is going to be equal to just f modulo n. So the picture I drew above is going to is going to look something like this. So that's and the w is going to be k cross minus and it's going to be the full rectangle. So uh, my strands are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 my strands are going to go like this. One, two, three, four, five. And that's W. And then I do the tau, the tau KN thing, which is going to work like this. And then I, and then I'm just going to so that's tau k sub n, and then v is just the identity. So, 
So we get uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you see that F sends 1, 2, 4, 2, to 5, 3, to 6, 4, to 7, and 5, to 8. Right, right, right. So if if something maps to itself, then it's either it's gonna be encoded somehow in V and W. So either uh, either V is gonna contain the whole row of W, or V is gonna contain nothing out of that row. Yeah, there's some. Uh, the the fixed points of your permutation are naturally in are naturally encoded into V and W in, in a in a particular way. Right. So. So module n, this is just v times w inverse, but then there there are the, the, the possible number of such pairs is, is whenever you have a fixed point, you get two options for v and w, which give you the same v times w inverse. Okay. And finally, I guess I don't have much time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue next time. But the the final yeah, well, by the way, so this was this construction was done in this paper by Knudsen, Lam, and Spire on positroid varieties. And finally, the, the knot or the link, the link associated to F. So, so I'm going to denote this by F V comma W, which by definition is that just V times tau K N times W inverse the same uh, the same formula is here is given by is given by the closure of the braid beta f where where beta f is by definition given by you take the you take beta of w times beta of v inverse where <laughs> where beta of w is so if w is si1 si2 it's a positive braid corresponding to a permutation sigma i1 sigma i2 all the way up to sigma i l uh, okay so to recap well uh, okay so a positive braid Remember, we have these generators sigma and sigma inverse. So a braid is positive if it's a product of these, of sigma i's in the positive degrees. Right? So you are not allowed to use sigma inverse on the sigma. Right. Well, uh, almost right. If you, if it has the same, if it if it corresponds to a reduced word, then it does not depend on the choice of the reduced word. So, for example, uh, as a counterexample, if you take sigma one squared, and then that that that's a braid that looks like this, it maps to the identity, but but it's not the only one. Even though it's a positive braid. Uh, it's not the only one. The the kind of the empty braid also maps to the identity mutation, but that the reason is that this word s one squared is not reduced. So any two reduced words for a given permutation can be related by these braid moves and commutation moves, and therefore the two braids are the same. So rate of w is called a positive braid lift of of a permutation w and so this beta of w is going to be a positive 
positive braid and beta of v is going to be a negative negative braid Right, yeah, that's a reduced word, basically. Yes, any reduced word for the same permutation is going to give me the same braid. So for example, yes, if I take S1, S2, S1, that corresponds to... Uh, a braid that looks like this. If I take S2, S1, S2, that corresponds to a braid that looks uh -huh. like this. Uh, yeah, and, and these two, you, ca you can see that they these two are isotopic, right? You can kind of, you can take this braid and you can move it past the, in between the two, in the you can take this wire and move it in between the other two wires, kind of down to get here. All right. Yeah, I, I know I'm, I'm not being exactly clear this time, so uh, next time I'm going to explain this a little bit more. And yeah, the, the, the point is that you can take this, this link and then you can use the home fully polynomial to compute the number of FQ points of your positroid variety surprisingly enough so that's it thanks a lot for for showing up and i'll see you on friday